Tak. So that panel is, is pretty vague. Um, the, what I'm going to, to tell you in these two sessions is basically my personal journey through moving from academia to industry. And so I realized that when I was in academia, I was completely sheltered uh, from what was existing in industry, what mattered, what didn't matter. And I went through several uh, stages. So I'm pretty much going to go through the first stage with you today and through the second stage um, tomorrow. So before I start, who here is in the industry? Okay, that's the third or fourth. Good. So <clears throat> I believe that this class wouldn't have existed a few years ago uh, because really uh, no one, I think, organizing a machine learning summer school would have cared about what happened in the industry. And so there is more and more uh, companies going to NIPS, to ACML, and you see all the big ones. Um, but usually what you see by these companies is what they publish. That is the more academically oriented work of these companies, which is often not used in production. Uh, and you don't necessarily see what happens you know, um, behind. And as such, people in PBA tend to think that it's incredibly dull. Well, at least I used to think that. Uh, and so it's really to, to uncover about what, what happens. Uh, some of this is dull, uh, some of this isn't, and I'll try to, to cover the whole thing. Um, I think the, uh, the biggest thing uh, you need to understand, and that's going to be mostly topic for tomorrow, but still, is that there's a wide variety of problems in industry. And I tend to believe there's, there's actually a wider variety in industry than there is in academia. It's not the case for everyone, and uh, I mean, you have a, you've had a whole bunch of different classes uh, on different topics for this machine learning summer school, but mostly what you see in publications uh, is about predictive performance. That is, you're going to write a paper, and maybe you're going to have a few theorems thrown in there, but ultimately, uh, you're going to have a data set, and you're going to show that you're going to do better on that data set. And so you start to think, uh, when you're in this uh, publishing mode, that the whole point is to do better on the given data set. Okay? And you try to refine your model and to find some new tricks, some new regularization to solve that problem. I think um, another reason why we tend to do this is because when we start a PhD, so actually I don't know how many of you are PhD students, how many of you have completed a PhD, but when we are in a PhD or just after a PhD, Usually, it start to, it's hard to get a good grasp of everything that happens. And so when we start a PhD, our PhD advisor usually has circumscribed, circumscribed some problem for us that, that we can work on. And so we don't necessarily immediately think about what other problems are there. And so uh, <clears throat> in the industry, like way beyond improving predictive performance, you have a whole bunch of other problems. And 
First, no one tells you about these problems. And then, unless you're in a very mature company, no one in this company realizes that there are problems. Okay? And so I'll talk about, for instance, optimization of decision making. I'll talk about A-B testing. Everyone does A-B testing the, th the same way, which is the wrong way, but no one thinks about it. Um, increasing operational efficiency. Uh, again, um, when, I, when I first joined Prideo, I said, oh, we can do this automatically. And my boss told me, yes, but we have a, an entire team of engineers that do it. So why would you want to do it automatically? Like, well, because it's going to free an entire team of engineers to do something else. Uh, and yeah, they don't realize about these problems. And so if you, if you don't make that conscious effort, it's really to get stuck on just, I'm going to improve predictive performance. So just to get the predictive performance out of the way, today is going to be, how do you improve predictive performance? Uh, so that, that's done. And if for those of you not in the industry, you can learn what you need to do uh, to prove your worth regularly in industry. For those of you in, in the industry, maybe you learn something. And again, second part tomorrow is what's not, not about predictive performance. So I really, as I said, uh, I'm pretty much going to describe my journey from academia to industry and usually go through three stages. Um, the first one is, I'm going to use that great model, which is usually the model you've worked on during your PhD, uh, and that's going to greatly improve the results. And so at the moment, is I'm going to use deep learning, uh, and you know, I'm going to show them. So that's the first stage. Uh, let's say it lasts about six months. Then you realize that doesn't work. Uh, that these dumb ideas all these people have actually worked really well in practice. And you came up with your fancy model and that didn't bring anything. And people start telling you, yeah, the only thing that matters is adding features into your model. And that's incredibly dull, uh, even though it's useful. And so you start to get a bit depressed. And that can start, I mean, that can last for a bit. And then said, you realize that there are many other questions. And then you realize that these are both academically interesting and they can have a profound impact on the company. And so you start working on them. Um, there was a great talk about this last year at ICML by Leon Boutou on this keynote, uh, which was what are the great problems we need to focus on in the industry and they have nothing to do with predictive performance. So I'm going to talk about Prideo um, for a few slides just to present uh, to you what kind of problems we work on. Uh, by no means is this an ad for Prideo, really. Uh, I just want to give you to get to give you a better idea of the kind of problems we, we need to work on. So Prideo is an advertising company. That means we buy advertising spaces on websites. Um, because unlike Google, we don't have our own website where people go to, so we buy advertising spaces on other people's websites. And then we display ads for our clients, and our clients are people who sell goods on the internet. Okay, so you can maybe, uh, we can maybe display an ad on El País website, for instance, and we're going to display an ad for Walmart. Okay? Uh, and the whole point is that, and you see why this is relevant, whenever we display an ad, we pay some amount of money to the website. Okay? So regardless of what happens with the ads, we pay El País. However, Walmart only pays us when the user clicks on the ad. Okay? So if the, if we buy an ad and the user doesn't click, we lose money. Uh, and so that's the number of, that's pretty much the best number I could get, that's the number of uh, cluster nodes we have at Prudio. And the numbers don't, don't really matter, but the whole point is uh, it increases pretty much regularly. Uh, I think now we have the biggest or the second biggest product cluster in Europe. Um, but in general, is that we get more and more data, and that's something you've heard more and more. Uh, just that, that volume of data, as a researcher, you can do nothing, and you get more data, uh, as long as you wait for it. And so we'll see how this can be useful, and how this also won't solve all your problems. So to give you a concrete examples of retargeting, uh, let's say I go to this website, uh, so that's a, um, a clothing merchant, and I look at this and a sweater, uh, and then I just move on and I go to Le Bon Coin, which is a French website, uh, second hand, and I like pony, so I'm going to look uh, at this pony, and you can see on the side, you do have an ad uh, for the website you just visited, okay? Now you see we're quite clever because that's not the exact same jacket. That I done this presentation a few years ago, that would have been the exact same one, but we've improved since then. Uh, and even, you even get shoes. Uh, so in practice, 
you land on a web page, uh, again, let's say L page, any web page, and that website contacts Crudio uh, and its competitors. There's actually an intermediary called an ad exchange, but that doesn't really matter. Um, so we're being contacted. And an auction starts, and we have to uh, participate in this auction within 100 milliseconds, and to say, how much are we willing to pay to buy this space? Okay. So they expect a price from us, from us, and from everyone else, and I'm speaking too loud. Uh, and the the space is going to go to the highest bidder. Okay. Uh, and again, that's 100 milliseconds every time you go on a website. So we participate in about 20 billion auctions per day, and we display about 3 billion ads per day. Yeah. Yeah, okay, uh, so uh, I'll go into more details later. Oh, by the way, yeah, uh, you can interrupt me anytime when you have questions. Um, the information, so a company like Google, is the, uh, is the bulk of the information is what is the query. As I said, we don't have any websites, we don't have any query. So the information we have about the user is the entire user browsing history on the merchant's website. Okay. Yeah. Um, so technically, we could gather the browsing history on all the merchants' websites to display that for one merchant, but we not, we don't do that because clients tend to not like us. Um, so if we want to display an ad for Walmart, we're going to we're going to see when and what did the users see on the Walmart website, and maybe what did they use buy, how much did it cost, and everything. So the bulk of the information is really uh, the interaction between the user and the client. But we also have things like, what is the current website? Because some uh, ads, for instance, have a poor positioning on some website and a good positioning, so this also has an influence. So, and, uh, so the details of the auction set is it's called real-time bidding. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really in real time. And for now, we're going to assume that it's a second price auction. So a second price auction means the highest bidder wins the right to display ads, but only pays the price of the second highest bidder. Okay? Uh, that guarantees you uh, a property known as truthfulness, which is that the optimal strategy is to bid the expected game. What do I mean by that? That is, on average, if I display an ad, how much money am I going to win? Okay? And that amount is exactly the amount I need to bid. Okay? Uh, I won't go into the detail right now as to why this is the case. Uh, you can actually compute the interval and make the derivation and you'll end up on that result. Uh, it's just three-line computation, but the whole point is that right now we'll assume uh, that's true, and so you have to bid your expected gain. And what is the expected gain when I display an ad? It's how much I'm being paid by a client whenever there's a click, and that's the contract between the client and me, times what is the probability that there's actually going to be a click. And that's obviously unknown. And so people realized that and said, well, now if I want to do a better job, I need to improve my ability to predict the problem to use click. And so, that's great. Now I have a prediction problem. Okay? So, and there's another problem. Um, so once we win the display, we now, uh, we directly in contact with the website, and then we're going to choose, we're going to actually make a real-time banner. So we, in real time, we're going to choose the best products to display in the banner. And we're also going to choose the, uh, the color of the banner and the layout. And that also takes about 20 milliseconds. So, as I said, now if you follow this, You've identified two problems. The first one is a prediction problem, click, no click, so I have a classification problem, which is amazing. Uh, and the second one is a recommendation problem. Uh, I need to find the top products. Uh, so I don't think you had a class on recommended systems uh, at a summer school. Uh, but I'll briefly mention this because I'm not going to mention it afterwards. Uh, when people think about recommendation, what they usually think about is the Netflix price in 2007. Um, so Netflix, uh, you know, it's a video rental company, uh, well, no, it's a sort of streaming company. Uh, and they had uh, this big price of the 1 million euro uh, where you had to improve their recommendation system. Except that uh, the recommendations, the uh, performance metric for the recommendation system was how well can I predict a rating? And really, that's not what recommendation is about. Recommendation is what can I show the best products? which has very little to do with how well can I predict the rating. Because you can very well predict the rating of a movie that's never going to be seen, that's good according to that metric, that's terrible in practice. So uh, I, can, I can talk to you later about this uh, offline if you want, but we'll focus really on the prediction problem. So we've identified prediction problems. 
And when I was in contact with Crudio, basically the, the discussion revolved around, you know, can you help us on that prediction problem? And I was really happy because it was like, well, yes, that's what I've been doing. I know pretty well how to solve a prediction problem, so let's do that. So now it comes back to Joanne's question. In that problem, what is the, uh, the list of inputs? It's, um, yeah, pretty much whatever we can collect with the user and, and the context. Um, one major difference with what you usually see when you have a data set is that there is potentially no limits to uh, the features I can have. Okay, I'll come back to that there. Every feature has a price, but I'm not even a fixed data set. I can add things to the data set if I want to. And that's actually a huge part of the job, which is which features are actually meaningful to solve the preparation problem. Um, then you need to choose a model class. And uh, so the whole point is that we have to reply in 100 milliseconds, but we do a lot of predictions in that 100 milliseconds, so we need to find fast models. Now, there's another big difference with what we usually see uh, in more academic literature, is that in this particular problem, there is very little signal. Okay. Um, the a user is going to click or not based on their mood. Uh, I don't know the uh, maybe the, the lag on their computer. It, it, it depends on many factors which are definitely not represented by your features. And so you're mostly digging through noise. Okay. There's very little signal. And when you see all the, um, the literature, but uh, deep learning, for instance. Uh, deep learning is vastly different. Deep learning, you have a highly structured data, but almost everything is in the data. Maybe you lack, you know, stereoscopic vision in some cases, but that's better. So what everyone does, uh, that's also what we do, you use a logistic regression. Okay. So I'm not going to teach you what logistic regression is. Uh, I'm assuming you all know what it is. Uh, but it is basically, it is a generalized uh, linear model. And again, uh, you might wonder, why do you use this when you have so many better models out there? And I know that because on my data set, it does a lot better than your logistic regression. Actually, logistic regression is the dumb baseline I use. Well, again, uh, that's because in some settings, that's actually what matters. When you have little signal, much noise, you don't put a very complicated model um, to, to, pr to predict. There's another difference, which is our information is highly unstructured. Okay. You, as features, you might have uh, the product scene. How do you encode the product scene, the current URL? How do you encode the current URL with maybe the time of the day? We know very well how to encode the time of the day. You have things coming from many, many different sources. Uh, when you use more complex models, usually it's much cleaner than that. Uh, you only have pixels. You only have, you know, uh, subtract coefficients. Um, it, it's a lot simpler. So the first issue um, you, you need to do when you work on, on that kind of data, I'm not sure it's, it's in all the, com the big companies I can think of. Uh, that doesn't mean it's necessarily all the companies, uh, but whether it's um, Google, Facebook, Amazon, uh, or Crudio, we didn't have that kind of data. And some data can take a lot of different values. Okay. So let's imagine, for instance, what interests me to mention is the current URL. On which websites is the user? Because this can have an impact. How do you deal with data which has um, that many modalities? Uh, so a list of items seen. Uh, a merchant can have 10 million items, and also these items come and go. How do you deal with that? So what people usually do, uh, and you see this mostly in NLP, uh, it's uh, use a dictionary and use one hot encoding. Okay. So just a quick survey, who knows what is uh, one hot encoding a dictionary? Who doesn't? Okay, so a few people didn't get the question. So what we'll do, and that's going to be a simplified version, is um, and if I'm doing NLP, I'm going to associate each word with an index. Okay, so I have my dictionary. My dictionary has a fixed size, let's say 100,000 words. So I'm going to associate to each word an index between 1 and 100,000. Uh, I started at 0 for snobbish purposes, but you can start at 1. Uh, and then when you have uh, the word which is associated with the index i, 
what you're going to do is you're going to represent that word with a vector which is extremely sparse, which only has zeros and it has as many zeros, well, it has as many coordinates as the number of words in the dictionary, all of them being zero except for uh, a one pretty particular word you're interested in. Okay. And now what you do is if you build a linear model with this particular vector x, then you realize that if you take, so w is your parameter vector, if you take the top value between w and x, given that x is as this form, that's only, you're basically extracting the element wi. Okay. And so this way of encoding is really another way of saying, I'm going to have one parameter for words uh, that I'm going to learn independently for each word. And if you have more complex models that doesn't need to be that simple, maybe that's not going to be a, a scalar, that's going to be a vector which you're going to do something with it. But that's the whole point. And so, well, we can do this. We can build our dictionary. So on the first index, let's say we have google.com, uh, the second one, Facebook, and the uh, last one, we might have had too many digits, but that's the whole point. Then we have, you know, this website is great. And we have the associated uh, parameter, the, the associated value for each of these websites. That's well known, everyone does that, that's absolutely fine. Now you have a new website coming in. So you have to add an entry to your dictionary with this parameter. Yeah, I'm sorry. So on, on this kind of matrices in practice, you're using the base website, or you're using also all the slash, uh, one of three types of slash? Yeah, so uh, I don't know whether or not I, I should mention this. Uh, that's entirely up to you. So these are basically features. Uh, and you can treat them as completely, uh, you can treat them as completely different. So you can say uh, one feature is going to be the whole website. Uh, another feature is going to be um, one feature is going to be the entire uh, URL string. Another feature is going to be just the first part, just the second part. You do whatever you want. You just treat them as different features. Um, so yeah, so you have, uh, so you build your dictionary, so you need to store all these numbers, but that's fine. What you also need to store is, when I get a website, where in the dictionary should I look? Okay, and again, it has to be really fast. Now, uh, there's an issue with this, is that, well, maybe some websites will appear once. And so you've stored an entry for them, and that's going to stay there. And uh, now current website, you see they have random strings of characters uh, in the URL. That means every time someone visits a new website, you add an entry to your table. And you, you basically your table expands dramatically, increasing uh, storage space, but also increasing search time for the remaining ones. So the technique everyone I know of uses is called hashing. So who knows about hashing? Well, I didn't know about hashing. Okay, um, so for those of you who didn't uh, raise a hand, uh, that's hashing. So in the hashing, my table is not going to have a fixed size, okay? And I will uh, specify the size of my table. And now I'm going to, defi to define a hash function. So a hash function is what? It's a function which takes any input, in that particular case it's going to take a string, and it's going to output an index, okay? And so right now, here I chose um, k equals 24. So I have 2 to the 24, a uh, little less, a uh, little fewer than 17 million entries uh, in, my, in my table. And so my hash function, whatever the string is going to output a number between uh, 0 and 2 to the k minus 1. Again, I choose this hash function. And so now, when I want to have this entry, uh, I want to know the parameter associated with, with Google. My hash function tells me it's uh, 14563, and so I basically go to that entry and I see the parameter associated. Okay. Um, this has uh, many good properties. First, search is immediate. I just have to compute my hash function and I get that value immediately. Second, storage space is constant. Okay. So no matter what people visit, uh, my storage space is constant. But now there's something weird, because my storage space is constant, despite the number of URLs growing. So what happens? Well, what happens is you get collisions. Uh, so my hash function, obviously, since it takes the biggest set of inputs as it has the output, 
is going to map two different URLs in my particular case to the same index. Okay, so two different URLs which may or may have anything in common. I mean, that's defined by my hash function, which has no knowledge of URLs, or going to use the exact same parameters in my, in my model. So what is the impact? Well, honestly, if, let's say, the hash function maps google.com and my personal website to the same value, it will learn the parameter associated with that index is going to be the one that works best on average, on these two websites, okay? Since, unfortunately, I think this website is more popular than this one, what's likely to happen is that the parameter at index 14563 is almost entirely going to be determined by the performance of google.com. So, in other words, you, no matter how many URLs are in my table, the strong ones will dominate. Um, and so th that's great because uh, if I have hardly visited URLs, I don't need to care about them. They will have maybe some parameter associated with them, but they will not hurt the performance of the bigger ones because the bigger ones will have more weight in my learning. Okay. So hashing, and hashing, the, the reason I ask about hashing is that it's hardly studied in the literature. Um, it does perform regularization. Uh, in some uncommon ways, and I think there's a lot of beliefs uh, and maybe over promises also about what it does. And I think it would be great to have a better understanding of of hashing as a technique and as a regular right. Yep. Yeah. So uh, I would expect that maybe it should be the other way around. If everybody visits Google, they don't get much information from it. But if very few people visit Google as a Google. Website, and I know that they are machine learners, and I know a lot of things about them, so I would really focus my recommendations on that information. Okay. Um, so we'll address this in the second part of the talk, but uh, the, the quick answer is if the metric you're looking at is the average performance, <coughs> it doesn't matter if you learn a lot about five users. I'm not telling you that we have five users on my website. Uh, it really it matters a lot more to learn very little about an enormous amount of users than a lot about a small number of users. Because that's the way average performance works. So you might think that's a bad thing, but no matter how little I learn about, uh, about Google.com, if I have several billion users in my database who go to Google.com and only a few tens on, on my website, uh, that model will favor uh, Google.com. It doesn't pay to personalize it, it only pays on for its individual, right? So you do it once and for all rather than individually. So I'm not sure so I'm not sure I understand your question, so I'm gonna make an answer and if that's not the answer to your question, you can uh, re ask it differently. Um, there's uh, there's there's really a rule when you deal with huge values, which is so when you have a discussion with people and say what can we do? There's always someone to say, we can do something extremely smart that's only going to work on a tiny amount of people. And that usually doesn't matter. Uh, if it only works on a tiny number of people, it's not going to matter at all. So, no, you, you can, maybe I can do something extremely clever for the people on my website, but unless I find something which works across all small websites of the world, it won't matter. So, personalization only works insofar as you can personalize the same way across your entire volume. Does that make sense? Did I answer your question? Okay. Yeah, so, well, if you think in optimization terms, um, what you're going to average is the gradient of your performance on google.com and the gradient of your performance on my personal website. And so, if there's really nothing to learn on google.com, then the gradient is going to be relatively close to zero, because there's just not much to do. 
And so if at some point the gradient gets close to zero, that gradient with respect to that website will dominate. But if it doesn't, and in practice intends not to, uh, then this term will dominate. So you, you're right, it's not in sheer volume, it's not the sheer volume that matters. Uh, if, if really that website is insensitive to the value of the parameter, then it's not gonna be, a, it's not gonna matter. Uh, but in practice, it, it does actually uh, care. Okay. So, yeah. But by the way, this is not the like standard way for hashing, right? Because hashing normally we put like a linked list in the collision part. Well, um, it depends. Uh, the It depends what you want to do on, on hashing. So I think that's, that's the standard way you do hashing when the number of elements you want to hash is much smaller than the table. Because in, in our case, the table is, oh, so you, then you want to go through the entire, uh, yes, but then the, again, we come back to the storage space increases linearly with the number of URLs visited. Basically, when you don't do this, uh, so that's the standard way I know of hashing in the advertising industry. Uh, Again, because it offers you to not care about uh, like low volume URLs. Uh, now, if you especially want to keep this, maybe you want to build a linked list, uh, but there is an associated storage cost and you need to regularize the not. So, example of a hash. I'm going to go to gobirdie.com and here I'm only going to hash on, oh, so yeah. But how do you how do you be sure that Google, for example, and Facebook, which are two very big websites, wouldn't collapse? Like, collab yes, uh, so I, yes. So the short answer is you don't, and um, you see that the if you plot, and there's going to be uh, a synthetic plot, but that's the rough idea. If you plot the volume of websites against their index, you realize that there are really very very few high volume websites. And so if the space in which you hash is big enough, that probability is really low. Now if it still uh, matters, you can do different things. Either you treat them separately, saying, I know, I know I'm know, i gonna hand code these few thousand websites and I really want them to have their own parameters. Uh, another way is to use multiple hash function. And so you're gonna hash them multiple times and they may collide on one of them but not on all of them and so you still have some freedom. Uh, it's you have multiple ways around this. Um, people I talk to usually don't think that that's big of an issue, and it just hash ones. So uh, I'm going to go bernie.com, and I'm hashing on four bits because I can only afford four bits when I go on gobernie.com. Uh, and so well, that's that's my vector, and so I'm going to predict uh, with this particular vector. Now it so happens that uh, at Prudio I see a visitor on gobirdie.com and I'm wondering whether or not I should display an ad for Smith and Wesson. Uh, okay, this is a gun company. And so if you do it the, the standard way, well what's going to happen is you compute the hash for gobirdie.com, it's 12, so you put a 1 here, you compute the hash for Smith and Wesson, that's 4, so you put a 1 here, and that's, that becomes your new x vector. Okay? And so, uh, when, you, when you're going to compute your linear model, when you're going to add all of this. And so W transpose x, you're basically going to do W4 plus W12. Okay. And so I'm going to do a sigmoid, and we can assume that the sigmoid is close to zero because the property of x are close to zero. For instance. Um, and so my sigmoid is almost just the exponential, and so I have a product of exponential. Okay. And so what that means is that I'm treating the fact that the user is on gobirdie.com and the fact that the ad is for Smith and Wesson completely independently of each other. Say the PCTR, the, the property of click um, of, the, of these two events is the property of the click of one times the property of click of two. Okay. And I don't take into account any dependency between the two. And so, oh, my moves. So now what you're going to do is you, the way to uh, alleviate this is you're going to introduce cross features and then you're also going to hash 
the combination of these two, and that's going to give you a new hat, which is six. And so now my vector is going to have three ones, one for Smith and Wesson, one for Bo Bernie, and one for the, uh, the conjunction. And I'm going to use a linear model on this on this new thing. Okay. Uh, so the way you can view it uh, is well, that was my original x. That was that was my uh, x with the plus features, which has a one extra. So when I take the dot products with my x cross feature, I have the original part because this one and this one are still here. But now I also have an extra term. And I basically have one extra term per conjunction of the original features. Okay? So every time my original x had a 1 in i and a 1 in j, I added a term. Okay? So now I don't have as many terms in my dot products as your number of original features, I have pretty much the square of that particular number. Okay. So if, if you view it differently, uh, I'm gonna, okay. Uh, so, okay. Uh, I'm just gonna uh, stop a bit here because here I said wij was said that w was a vector. And so I, I, I write W as a, as a matrix, uh, which is weird. Um, the, the, the point I want to, to come across is that when xi and xj are both on at the same time, so when goverty.com is on and Smith and Wesson are on, then there's another value of W that starts to be turned on. Okay. So there are some values, w, that are turned on whenever there's only one variable in x that's turned on, that's equal to 1, because remember, x is 1 and 0. And there are values that are only turned on when both of them are equal to 1. Okay, and these are different values. And if you think of it, that's exactly a matrix. So I don't know if it's obvious to everyone, but if, if I have x, X transpose and M, okay, and uh, so I compute this this product. It's going to be basically a sum of all the elements of my matrix, but they only choose the elements in my matrix such that X i was equal to one and X j was equal to one. Okay, so writing this in matrix form. If I say I only, only want to pick a subset of the elements of matrix M, I can do this with appropriately chosen x vectors, and I get this exact result. Yes. But your your dictionary is only say add elements of, right? Yes. So you have uh, so you have pairwise combinations now, and if you have you know theme wise combinations, you have n to the d in today's dictionary getting like beyond collision, right? Like, you get to the same vector. Uh, exactly, yes, I'll come to that in an instant. So that's what the matrix looks like. That's a pictorial representation. The true matrix is bigger. Um, so that's my, that's my matrix M. And what you can see is that many elements in that matrix are the same. Okay. So you have 5.9 all the way here, 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 here. And there is, uh, there is no coherence. Uh, about where they are the same. That's basically where the hash function had a collision. Okay, so the hash function sends this particular these all these all the yellow index, uh, all the yellow indices to I mean all the yellow entries to the same index. Okay, so whenever you take this element of the matrix, this element of the matrix, that element of the matrix, you'll always get the same answer. Okay, so your matrix is in theory, as I mentioned, extremely large because my x is in theory extremely large but you only have few different elements in that matrix and you only have, if you hash on k bits, you only have 2 to the k different elements on that matrix and the way they organize in the, mat the matrix is completely random, is defined by your hash function. Okay? So effectively when you say I'm going to use cross features and hashing I said, I'm going to use a second order method with a matrix which has a random structure. And I'm going to try to find the best parameters in that random structure. 
Okay, and that's uh, again that's level two cross features. You're going to level three cross features. You're going to have a huge tensor, but the, the tensor doesn't have more free parameters than that matrix. So it just has more elements which are equal to each other. Okay, and so that's why I think um, it lacks also a deeper understanding. But that's an extremely weird structure. And what can you say about that kind of thing? Okay, when you have uh, that's not usually the way we uh, limit the amount of elements in a matrix, and we'll come to that just afterwards. Uh, but as a way, which seems to work well in practice, how come? So, now when people say this, is that, oh, that's great, I have a hashing function. Now the number of parameters in my model is independent, so I can just add as many features as possible, and that's going to work. And it's going to be great, yeah. So you can you can do it either way. Uh, you can have one set of parameters for the unary terms and one, another set of parameters for the binary terms. But you can also yes use the exact same parameters for that vector and for that matrix. It again it shares the same spirit uh, and we lack understanding of uh, why do we need different ones, why do unary and binary parameters with SLD need to be different, how would they need to be different. Um, so the reason why you don't want to add as many variables as possible, even though it's magic, is because at some points uh, collisions will hurt you. So if I go back to my example of google.com uh, and other, google.com will start colliding with tons and tons of other features. Okay? And suddenly, even though google.com has a huge volume, all these tons of other features in aggregates will have, will, are going to have a volume similar to that of google.com. Uh, and so, suddenly you're not going to be able to learn google.com that well. And then you can say, well, that's not the problem because I'm going to learn the other ones better. And so I'm just moving computational power away from Google.com to other things. But if the other thing is uh, someone went to my personal website on a uh, Saturday at 10 a.m. and they displayed an ad for this particular thing because I had a cross feature of level four, then that feature is completely useless. So I'm going to completely overfit on that particular feature. So I'm going to decrease the performance of uh, Google.com and not increase the performance of the other ones because I'm going to be with it. Um, another thing is that every time uh, you want to add a variable, it needs to be computed and stored. So I'm going to give you back the uh, angle of calculations. When, you when we have people coming in uh, to Curio, they say, oh, why don't we add this feature? And, you know, I'm sure it's a great feature. Uh, and they can think of anything. So then, when you have this, of course you want to train your model on that feature, so you have to store that model. So that feature needs to be computed for every ad we display, again, which is about 3 billion per day, how many days uh, we use to train the model, and then it's usually on uh, four, bit, uh, 4 bytes. And so storing the feature, one feature, is half a terabyte. It's not that much, but that's for every single feature you can think of. Uh, so suddenly storage might become an issue. Then, this feature is used to train your model, but it's also used to compute your prediction in real time. So you have to have this feature accessible in RAM in real time. So for every user, and every advertiser, you need to store this feature. And that takes about 40 gigabytes of RAM. Again, 40 gigabytes of RAM, it's not that much. But that's for one feature. Okay. So, you need to be careful, both for statistical reasons, uh, because you're talking about fitting, but also uh, for, uh, in terms of resources, but what kind of features you have. And so what you want to do is keep your selection. Um, okay, so maybe Francis mentioned this in passing with group sparsity. Um, I don't know if otherwise. Uh, so you actually want to choose what are the optimal features and the optimal cross features. And so what's interesting is that uh, 
So the way you, I'm sorry, first the way you do it. So the standard way you use sparsity is this one. You add an L1 penalty. Uh, you've all learned this. You can call that lasso uh, in case of a quadratic loss. L1, that's fine. Now that's not exactly what you want to do. Uh, because when you regularize with the L1 penalty, you're not going to regularize the URLs. You're going to set the parameters for some of these URLs to zero. But that's not what I want, because if I've only done that, I still need to extract the URL for everyone, and then say, oh, for these URLs, I don't want to, I don't want to use the parameters. So I want to force all the parameters associated with all the URLs to be equal to zero, so that I can stop extracting the URL. Okay, does that make sense? So you can only, that's, so we have this dual language, usually a feature uh, is one coordinate. In our case, a feature is the URL, which can take many, many coordinates because of the, uh, say the, the dictionary equivalent. So, and the feature can have many modalities, okay? So my feature is day of the week, and it has seven modalities. And so L1 only sets parameters associated with modalities to zero, and I want to set the parameters associated with features to zero. So, uh, simple trick, you can use group sparsity. Uh, so group sparsity, you define your groups as being all the parameters associated with a particular feature, and so now you encourage all of them to be equal to zero. <coughs> and you can still, this, this is still convex, that's still efficient, uh, so that's absolutely fine. Um, something just to know, uh, it's when you do this, you actually introduce bias, uh, and if you really want to be, like, make many, many features sparse, the lambda parameter needs to be fairly high, so the standard trick, which you might know, but just in case you don't know it, is you, you train that model with a high lambda to set the sparsity you want, and then after that, you only select these features and you train that using standard L2 penalty and you remove the L1 penalty. Um, and so, what I like about this, uh, I know you had uh, Arthur uh, coming, is that basically that's kernel selection. By defining cross features, I said I'm going to set a uh, an order to second order polynomial kernel. And so I'm not going to do the uh, logistic regression, I'm going to do kernel logistic regression with uh, second order polynomial kernel. Now, I don't want to do the full second order polynomial kernel because that's too many parameters, so I'm actually going to select the elements of my polynomial that I care about, okay? So the full polynomial kernel is this one, and I'm saying, no, I don't want all the M's to be there, I want to force some of them to be zero. So, effectively, you're doing kernel learning uh, by learning kernel for statistical efficiency. Now, uh, usually kernel learning is, uh, so you have things like NKL, but other, way, other than that, it's, it's a bit complicated. In this case, it's extremely simple. Okay, so that comes to, to my first. Uh, not predictive performance. So actually, feature selection uh, is the one idea on which I, I fought with, with my manager early on. Uh, and that's really, to me, a, a strong point. Adding features is a critical part uh, of an R&D when you try to predict it. You have, uh, again, you go to Facebook, there's a huge team dedicated to, associate, uh, to add features. And people will tell you adding features is what uh, what makes it work. And to some extent they're right, because as I said, we have very low signal in our case, and so adding features increases the signal. It's almost always better to increase the signal than just to do better with what little signal we have. I don't find that particularly exciting to add features. However, when you can help people do this more efficiently, first you have an uh, interesting machine learning problem, how do you do that well? How do you design your selection problem well? As I said, uh, you also have some strong optimization uh, problems involved. And it frees up resources. And that's extremely important. So if someone says adding features is important, that doesn't necessarily mean you need to add features. You can also be 
simplify the lives of people adding features uh, by designing automated algorithms to do that. Uh, there's another example, I'll come back to that in, in a few slides, which does the exact same thing. Uh, it's still in its infancy, but it, it, it holds great promise. Um, okay, so that was the first tool. Oh, yeah. Sorry, but um, finding the important features is nothing to do with finding new features. I mean, feature selection is not feature creation. So, what you presented before about select, selecting the best one is. The. the um, okay. You see what I mean? I see what you mean. Uh, so, I was a bit quick. When you. The whole. The difficult parts and the lengthy part of adding features to a model is not thinking about which features to add, is once you've thought about all of them, picking the good ones. And so, yes, you always need people to say, we can add this to that, but that's, that's fine. To me, that's the, well, that's the fun bit, and that's the easier bit. Doing the lengthy experiments to find amongst all of these, uh, the day of the week, should I try uh, one modality from Monday to Sunday, or should I try a day of the week and the weekends, uh, when should the weekend start? That's basically you try all of them and you see what works best, and that's that's the lengthy bit of it. Yeah. Sorry, when you uh, say adding features, you usually just try to build or select new features among the data you already have, or you also make some hypothesis of okay, I would like to collect this data if possible. I could ask my sorry, my instructors to do. Yes, um, so I'm only going to speak for Criteo here, uh, because I don't necessarily, I mean, the business is so that the answer might differ from other companies. Um, usually, it's, it's better to restrict yourself to data you can collect uh, without asking anyone. Uh, so, for instance, you know, let's say, um, you might think of, okay, can we, can we use as feature uh, what happened last year on the exact same day? Uh, that's fine, that is, that's data we collected uh, and, and we didn't use. Uh, or can we use maybe, instead of the ID of the product itself, uh, the category of the product? That's data we already have. Um, when that's data where you need to ask your clients to give you that data, Suddenly, you have to be much more conservative because you, go, you don't want to go to see your client every single day saying, oh, and what about this, what about that? Uh, and so you tend to think a lot more. That's why the bulk is we don't need to ask anyone. It's just data we didn't collect, but we could have collected. Let's collect it for now and see what happens. Does that answer your question? So I present to you a uh, standard uh, logistic regression with, with cross features, and I said uh, we use a matrix, and that matrix has a limited number of elements, and the way we limited the number of elements was by having this random structure, which is really weird. And so something you're all extremely uh, familiar with um, is, well, you can do it the other way, and you're basically going to encode this matrix as a low rank matrix. Now, the weird bit is that each element here still probably has too many elements. So you still want to do random blocks in this. Um, but the, the, uh, you still include more, the structure here is different <laughs> as the structure for a random matrix. So again, I actually in baselines, uh, you know, when you see, for instance, the endless baseline, I haven't seen many people using this model, uh, saying I'm going to use a, a second order um, logistic regression uh, with the low rank matrix. So, yeah, so basically you encode, you say your PCTR, so you have the unary terms, which I committed to simplicity, and then you have your binary terms of the matrix M, and you encode M as a low rank matrix. Okay. So it's basically you, you transpose, and now you, uh, you are you. One strong issue with this, uh, as opposed to the previous one, is that in that particular case, you lose convexity. And I'll need to talk uh, longer about using convexity because 
So when I was in Yasha's lab, I was laughing at people caring about convexity. Now, uh, because of the deep learning craze, uh, everyone laughs at people caring about convexity. Uh, and so, convexity still matters. Uh, it might not matter for the, the reason you think, but uh, in practice, it is really helpful to have convexity. And so, factorization machines are nice. Uh, they do work well. Losing convexity is an issue. So to, to summarize the difference between linear model, uh, linear model with cross features and factorization machine, let's say I have these uh, three possible websites, Go, Bernie, Drunk, Forever, and Hilarious. And uh, these three possible uh, advertisers, uh, JP Morgan, Smith & Wesson, and Care Bear. When you use a linear model, you basically say that your PCTR is a sum of these two elements. Okay. And they're independent. When you use level two cross features, you basically learn one different, say for the hashing, you learn one different parameter for this. So you have a much higher capacity model, but you don't share any information at all between the different things that happen. And when you use factorization machine, well, you say that the performance is a function of the dot products between one vector associated with the URL and one vector associated with the merger. So, Again, I briefly mentioned recommendation. This model seems to make much more sense. Okay. And if you try this on a standard data set, it will probably give you better performance. There is a strong issue with that model, which is that this regularization um, works equally for everyone. Let me rephrase this. Okay, Google.com has huge volume. Okay, so uh, when when you have only a data model and you learn Google.com, Google.com is going to trump everything else. But if it has a huge volume, that means that Google.com cross any advertiser is still going to have a decent volume to be learned well. And so you you will be able to for all these users to learn precisely their behavior on a specific combination of factors because you have a large volume of that specific combination of factors. Okay? So, then this large matrix, maybe this element here, corresponds to a combination of different, the current URL, the time of day, and everything, that has a large volume. And so I want to predict this well, and I'm going to predict this well. And all the others might slightly overfit, uh, because I don't share any parameters, and that might be an issue. But for one of them, I actually do a very good job. For the standard cross features, I regularize everyone equally. So all the low volume ones will do better, because that's a much more meaningful regularization. But the high volume one will do worse, because I, I, I have fewer capacity here for high volume ones uh, than I have here, okay? Because this parameter here again, does not need to be used for anything else than the high volume ones. It will be used for low volume ones, but I don't care about them. And for the high volume ones, was, let's say, I'm oh, sorry, I can actually, let's say this is the vector for google.com. This vector will be used for google.com and all possible advertisers. So I've regularized all possible advertisers associated with Google.com towards each other. But maybe I don't want to do this, because maybe these advertisers have very different behavior, and I have enough volume on Google.com across that advertiser to learn that well. So I don't want to force them to be similar. Uh, I can just let them be different. Is what I'm saying making any sense? Okay. Um, So, in, in other words, uh, here some values are going to be used for one case and some values are going to be used for a million cases. Yeah?
Yeah, so ultimately, uh, so ultimately you're right. If I don't restrict the, the rank of the matrix, I should recover that. Uh, again, save for the hashing, which has some unexpected properties. Um, in practice, remember the response time is critical. It's much faster to grab one element in the matrix than to do the dot product of two large vectors. So I also want to avoid, you know, uh, that range is going to be in the tens at most. Um, so I still have, I have far fewer capacity here than here if you don't have the hashing. So the bottom line is, when you do such a model, you greatly help all the low volume occurrences, but you actually hurt the high volume ones. Okay? Uh, it comes back to someone who was saying personalization. When you have a very specific case which has many people, you really want to personalize your answer to that specific case. So you don't want to regularize that case, you want to regularize the other ones. <laughs> that allows you to do this, that doesn't. So maybe you want to find a mix of the two. Okay, um, so I mostly spoke about discrete features for now. Um, sorry. I will talk now about uh, sorry, continuous features. So there are, uh, so you might have continuous features. Uh, one feature, for instance, would be the, the time of day. Okay. So if you think the time of day is is related um, to the probability of click, and so you want to use that in your model. So the time of day, let's say, is going to be in seconds. Um, zero is going to be midnight, um, and so you have that feature. Now there is so that's X. That's your continuous feature. The simplest way to use this is to say that the output is going to be W times X, and so if I write my output is a function of my input, that's basically going to be a line. Okay? And W changes the slope of the line. That's a very simple model. Maybe that's not at all what happens. Maybe in the morning and in the evening there's something, but in, in between there's something else. So I don't want to have that model. So the standard way of doing this is we're going to do, we're going to bucketize things. Okay? So someone, and again that's feature selection, that's the uh, lengthy part. You say X is my time of day, so I want to know is x uh, before 7 a.m.? Is x between 7 a.m. and I don't know, 9 a.m.? And so you can define a few values, let's say 10 different possible values for x as the time of day. And so you're going to include x as a one hot vector, which was one for the time of day you care about. Okay? And so now, when you do w transpose x, what you end up with is a piecewise constant function of the value. Okay? Is it obvious why you get this? And so that's suddenly that has more flexibility, and if you lack flexibility, you just increase the number of pieces. But now finding the number of pieces, the size of the pieces, and the length of the pieces is a bit of a thing. And that takes quite a while. So, uh, if you have a huge team, you can afford to do that precisely, otherwise you just do that uh, once and you hope that it kind of works. Uh, so, what we'll do, uh, one of the techniques uh, is you know, gradient boosted decision trees. So, gradient boosted decision trees are really not new. Again, who knows about gradient boosted decision trees? Okay. Um, who knows about decision trees? Okay. I'm not going to say who knows about trees. Um, so that's that's saying decision tree. Uh, so on the inputs you have uh, a variable or a bunch of variables, and uh, you're going to go. You're going to make a bunch of tests. And you know it, and ultimately you're going to try to predict well. In our case, we're going to try to predict well whether or not there's a click or not a click. Now, from a single tree, uh, you can actually use boosting uh, to learn more trees. So you have a forest, and basically, as in boosting, 
The first tree is going to try to classify correctly click or not click. Now you're going to make some mistakes. Now you're going to learn the second tree not to classify click or no click, but just to correct for the mistakes of the first tree. Okay? And uh, I'm not going to give you a class on very use of decision trees, but the whole point is that you're going to add trees like this, each tree to correct the mistakes of the set of the trees before it. And the whole point is that ultimately you hope to have a good classifier, and so you're going to take the average of the output of all the trees, uh, and you have, you're going to have a good classifier. So you can use this directly to predict the, uh, the fix through, right? It works okay. Uh, it doesn't work that great, and trees also in general do not handle uh, discrete features well. As I said, we have the URLs, we have many discrete features. So we want something to handle discrete features and handle continuous features. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take these continuous features, learn trees for them, and we're not going to use the, the property that they uh, provided to predict the click. We're going to use that to bucketize them. And how do we bucketize them? We check the final node in which they ended. So for each variable, uh, for each subset of variable, what is the final node in which they ended? And that's going to be the index of our bucketization. Okay? So we'll have I'll continue. Uh, so we'll have as many buckets as there are final nodes. And uh, so if I have a set of variables here, I'm going to go here here and here, and so that's index number 0, 1, 2, 3 out of 6, and so I'm going to represent that feature with 0, 1, 2, 3, uh, I'm sorry, here, yeah, that's it, 4, 5, 6, and that's my feature. And since I use gradient boosted decision trees, I have many trees, and so I'm going to go through the tree for each tree, and each of them is going to give me one feature. And so you have, if I have four trees, my continuous features are going to be transformed into four features, each one having as many modalities as the number of terminal, uh, as the number of leaf nodes in, in each tree. Okay? And the good thing is that when you classify, you don't, you don't just classify using one feature, you classify using all your continuous features. And so, you don't bucketize each feature independently, you can bucketize groups of features as a whole. Okay? So, my tree can take as input the time of day, uh, how many times has it been since the users last went to the merchant's website, and something else. Group them all together, learn my tree, and now all these features are going to be mapped to one a discrete feature which I can then feed into my logistic regression. So there was one question I skipped. Yeah. This seems uh, kind of involved. Uh, could you just use like a piecewise linear, like have 10, 20 weights associated to time event, and then do piecewise linear properties? It's. So you definitely can. Uh, and it's probably going to work okay. Now, the issue is, um, so each of these individual continuous features, you might use 10 for anyways. First one of the question is why? Maybe you want to use 2 for one and 200 for the other. And the 1020, if you say maybe 200 for all of them is too much, so you reduce all of them, but you don't want to reduce all of them. So how do you deal with this? Um, then comes the, the, again, the problem of uh, cross features. So if you have 10 single continuous features, you're going to use 20 for all of them. So that's going to give you a vector of size 200. Okay? Uh, but then all these 10, 10 single features can be also uh, crossed with all the 9 others. So you have 90 cross features. So times 20, that's only 1800 uh, parameters to work. So that's, I'm going to answer, I'm going to re answer your question directly. If I were you, that's the first thing I would try. Uh, and in general, the simple thing really works well. Um, what, you, what I've seen in companies is that this works, and now someone asks whether 20 or not works well, and they start devoting many people to try 18 and 22 and 25, and then seeing if you need to and give up the same amount to everyone. 
When you use that kind of technique, suddenly you say, you know what, I can do this automatically. Uh, and that's, again, that's going to free some people. So, in the second part is more going to be about uh, what people don't know they don't know. When it comes to the predictive problem where everyone has identified that uh, the predictive model was an issue, I say wait for them to see the issue, to solve it manually, and then you can come up with an automated system that does it. Uh, but you're right, in many cases maybe there won't be an issue, in which case you don't want to come up with that overly complicated system to solve it either. I'm sorry, can you repeat your question? Yeah, I'm not sure I understood which are the decisions to be made with respect to the problem of, for example, the time of the day. So is it like a possible combination of time of the day with, say, a week? Okay, so uh, the first thing that you need to do is build a decision tree. And so I think the question is, how do you build a decision tree? Is that, am I correct? So, no? Yes, no, it's just that they miss. Okay, so. Yeah, so, uh, basically, you, let's say you only have one variable, which is time of day, uh, and you try to predict clicks and open. So, you have your data set, and for each data set, you have the time of day and the binary variable that says click or not click. Okay? So, the only thing which you're going to do is first split. If uh, you're going to set a threshold saying if time of day is less than the threshold, I'm going to predict something. If time of day is more than the threshold, I'm going to predict something. Okay. And so you need to find that threshold. And so you try a bunch of them. So you have many different techniques, but you can try a bunch of thresholds and see which one works best. And so that defines this uh, split here. And now within that split, you already have a subset of your data set, and you start again. And you find another threshold. And you do this iteratively. And when you have many variables, either each threshold is going to only focus on one variable, uh, that's, you can absolutely do that, or it's going to focus on a combination of all variables. And your threshold can be time of day is less than that, or something else. So you can, you can, and that's another topic which is, how do you learn these, um, these splits efficiently? And then you can do it in different ways. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So now there's the issue of hybrid of discrete and continuous. Uh, so uh, again, I don't have a definite answer. Uh, one of the possibilities is for each value of the discrete variable, you you learn this. But you have many when you have many many discrete variables, uh, that's probably cumbersome. Uh, you, you really you can't afford to do this. Um, another way would be to somehow cluster your discrete variable to reduce, and now you try to learn one bucketization for each cluster. And it comes, there comes a question of how do you cluster your variables. Uh, the, the question quickly uh, mainly depends on what features do you have. And again, do you have reasons to believe that is the case or not? Uh, or you want, uh, as we mentioned before, uh, do something separate for the high volume URLs, which you think are important, and then the smaller ones you count them in one in one bucket. Okay. Um, yes, and so that picture is from a, a Facebook paper from two years ago, I think. Um, practical lessons from predicting clicks on ads on Facebook. And so that's what they do. They take the input features, uh, they find the tree splits. That's the leaf nodes in which they end up. And so they use this to create the bucketized version, and now they apply logistic regression. Okay. So again, you don't apply logistic regression just on these features. You concatenate these features with all the other ones which you already have, and you, 
that, that's how you use those features. Okay, I'm brief, briefly going to talk about uh, learning uh, because I think it's important. And uh, so at first, I, I, it was supposed to be in the title of my talk, and I deemed it not important enough to really still be in the title. Um, what I'm okay, I'm really not going to be technical about learning the priorities. I'm going to teach you what I learned the hard way because, uh, as Ron mentioned before joining Prudio, I was working in optimization. Uh, I was really enjoying it, and again, like predictive models, said, "Oh, I'm going to just improve the optimizer, and that's going to work so much better." So let's say you have a that's roughly you know the data we have. You have about a billion data points, and uh, you have about 100 million features, 100 million parameters to use. So in theory, uh, when you have that many data points, uh, you should use stochastic gradient set. Not necessarily plain stochastic gradient set. Uh, Jean Francis presented uh, SAG, SAGA, ZRG, all these methods. Uh, but you don't want to go through a whole batch before making it up because you just have too many um, too many data points. Uh, now, there are a few questions if you use the gradient really set. At a standard uh, company, you're going to have a few, from a few models to a few hundreds of models. Okay? Uh, we predicting the clicks, but maybe we're also predicting other things. Uh, maybe you don't want to have the same model for different countries. You have a whole bunch of models uh, learning all the time in parallel. How do you set a step size for all of these models? Maybe they're all different. Uh, so when you talk to people in deep learning, they tell you that 0 0.1 is a good step size. Uh, I think it is for some of the data sets, for others it's not. Uh, so how do you set it? Do you, do you try all of them? Now people are, in other teams are going to add features. Do so you change that step size when they add features? So you need to change something to your optimizer. Uh, also, how do you distribute the optimizer? Uh, maybe your data starts to be too big or to be on one machine. How do you do distributed stochastic optimization? You have a bunch of papers on this. They're not necessarily super easy. Um, theory assumes that the information to be gained from all data points is the same. In our case, let's assume your click-through rate is about 1%. You have one positive example for 99 uh, ads that did not click. Do you really think that that positive example brings as much value as the 99 negative examples, or maybe you should focus on the positive examples. And uh, so suddenly, when you, when you look at this, it comes back to uh, operational simplicity. It becomes much more convenient to use, to use batch methods. Uh, because I don't want to have one person tweaking uh, the step size all the time. Yeah. So I guess that your data is not IID. It is IID, but IID does not mean that they all have um, the same value. Uh, again, let's assume uh, you're looking for a needle in a haystack, and you have a million of examples, one where you found the needle, and all the other ones where you didn't find it, and I ask you to subsample that data set. Do you think you're going to subsample it randomly, or you're going to make sure you keep the examples where you found the needle, subsample the other ones, and then reweigh weigh accordingly? And that's, that's the whole point. Uh, random subsampling is not the most efficient subsampling methods uh, in some cases. Yeah? So there are, uh, yes, so there are many components that we do. Uh, the first one is, how much do we want to pay for this ad? And that's a prediction problem, because how much do we want to pay is proportional to the property that there's going to be a click. Now you're right, once we, once we want the right to display an ad, then that becomes uh, finding the best product, the best color, and that's not a prediction problem. Uh, that's different. And so, there are similar issues uh, with this, but here I'm really focused on how much to pay for the ad, uh, and so how to pay the the Okay, so again, I give it back to the envelope uh, calculation for people who want to improve the optimizer. 
And so the ML researcher, and at the very least, if you factor in all the costs, uh, that's about 100,000 euros per year to the company, okay? uh, with taxes and everything. And that's probably the bottom line. Um, the 16 CPU, 64 GB of RAM computer is 5,000 years. Okay. So, for the uh, if I can distribute my algorithm, which runs on one machine, for 100,000 euros, I can make it like 20 times faster. Okay. So, if you pay that much, or if you cost that much to the company, you better make it more than 20 times faster, otherwise I'm better off my computer. Okay? And if we're not talking about 20 times faster, because that's usually not the speed ups we see, if you talk about making it two times faster, then you have to do it in two weeks. Okay? So, uh, the, first, the first optimization is usually not algorithmic. Okay. So, there is, these are, so the questions you should ask are not necessarily how much faster can I make it, unless you can truly make it a lot faster, is how much more convenient can I make it. And when we worked on SAG uh, with Francis and, and Mark, uh, to me the most appealing feature was not that it was fast, it was that you didn't have to change the step size. And I thought that was amazing. You can just set one, well, one over L, uh, it was easy to compute L, because uh, you don't even have to compute the, the top icon value of the Hessian. And that works. And that, that is huge. But factor two really doesn't matter. Okay. And so uh, that's, that's, really, that's really important. So I'm not going to present super fancy optimization techniques. Uh, I'm just going to present the global picture. If you have a super fancy optimization technique, which does not get distributed, unless you work on medium data, it's not that interesting. And if it, if it gets distributed, but it requires a lot of hand holding uh, because of tuning the step size and everything, then again, uh, you're taking someone's time to do this. And if you go even further, a lot of companies have trouble hiring. So when you hire someone, you don't want that person to be tuning the step size. Okay. And so if, if, just a quick note here um, to give you the, the clearest picture. It completely depends on what you're doing. So when Google has their automated translation system, they have one model they've trained for weeks. That's absolutely fine to tune the step size for this one particular model and to make as much noise as you want in this. But you, when you constantly learn new models, uh, just like the ad uh, prediction models, then you don't want to supervise them because that takes time. So again, uh, it, it, it completely depends, but in, in our particular case, in other companies, you really want to automate the process much more than you want to be as efficient as possible. Uh, further things to take into account, that, uh, so when you increase the learning time, what's the issue, uh, besides not getting your paper accepted, is that you, you get more delay, okay? Your model runs in production later, and so that has some cost. And of course, so you'd like to reduce these costs by improving the competition value. But that's not the only thing incurring delay. For instance, uh, you need to wait for the data. So uh, in our case, we say click or no click. But sometimes the click does not occur right after a display. Okay? Sometimes there are a um, few minutes or a few hours. So every time we have a display, first we have a delay, which is we have to wait for a few hours to know if there's going to be a click or not. Now we have this data, we have to generate the training log from this data. That takes a bunch of time. And only then can we increase the learning. So, uh, when we were training on a single machine, it was about 24 hours. Okay, for our model. So, you gather the data, you generate the logs, and you learn the model. Now you go twice as fast. That's this. You haven't had the delay. You've reduced less than a quarter of the delay. Now you go 20 times as fast. There you are. You only, you only have a third of the delay. So you realize that there clearly are diminishing returns. And I, 
more often than, uh, than not, I've seen researchers at that stage focusing on this. Because that's, that's what they've been taught how to do. They've been measuring on how fast they can train the model. And in general, in industry, you're going to have this. And when you're here, it makes sense to go here, if you can do it quickly. Uh, but when you're here, just focus on these other parts, or just on other parts of the system. So really, uh, it's important to focus on the right problem. And that means, and that's why this uh, summer school is great, you can have a wide variety of problems. And if your expertise is optimization, well, at some point there's going to be nothing to optimize. Uh, so, you better understand what other parts could be useful. Uh, so, it's really important to know when uh, and uh, to focus on other aspects and which aspects to, uh, to focus on. And again, uh, what matters is, is the whole system. Uh, I think two years ago at Credeo, uh, we were improving the, uh, the click prediction system. And, you know, we won. Uh, Maybe uh, a few percent or a few tenth of a percent of, of revenue. And then they decided to change the, uh, the colors of the bag. Uh, and they won a few percent. And there was no machine learning involved. Someone says, red is nice. Let's put red bags. And, and at first it's a bit distressing, because you're like, all oh, my work is done for nothing. But at some point it forces you to think, you know, what actually matters. And I think that's really important. That it forces you to get out of your comfort zone, uh, so you need to make sure you, you actually can get out of, out of your comfort zone. Okay, so uh, I don't have that much time left. Uh, so just this. That's the comparison of optimization methods you see in all papers. Uh, stochastic methods have all of 1 over t convergence rate. Batch methods have linear convergence rate, even superlinear uh, convergence rate for second-order methods. Uh, the cost is independent of the number of data points. The cost is linear in the number of data points. Stochastic methods are fast early in the optimization. Batch methods are fast late in the optimization. And in fact, you don't care about this convergence rate because you have a minimax rate of 4 of 1 over t on the test error. Uh, there was a beautiful paper by uh, Leo Boutou and Rudy Bousquet in 2008 uh, on this topic. So really, uh, this doesn't matter. But in real life, you have to be careful with the step size of stochastic methods, whereas in batch methods you can do a line search and then do something else every day. Um, stochastic methods, you need to read a few papers to distribute uh, your method. Batch methods, well, that's fine. You split your training set across nodes and you compute the average gradient on each node and then you aggregate. That's about 10 lines of code. Um, stochastic methods, they're faster early on. Again, in our case, we retrain our model every few hours. When you see a paper, they randomly initialize the models. No one randomly initializes the models. If you've trained a model a few hours ago, the new model is going to be initialized as a solution of the previous model. So you're always close to the optimum. You just want to be a bit better. So that doesn't matter at all. So that again, that's, that's what matters. Uh, when you have uh, 100 times increase in, in convergence speeds, that's really interesting. If you have a Again, yeah, if you d divide your convergence time by two and it doesn't distribute, don't bother about it. And so again, yeah, the whole message is really robustness trumps accuracy. You really want to be able to forget about the optimizer and focus on other things. Um, so Credio, that's what we do. We use distributed LBFGS. LBFGS, I think, is from the 70s. Uh, Distribute, distribute, so you distribute the computation of the gradients across all nodes, that's super easy. And then the actual gradient update, uh, that's done on one node. You don't even distribute that part. And that works incredibly well. Again, that might not be the best optimizer. Right now, that's by far uh, the best optimizer, well, the best use of our resources. Okay, uh, one point. So, did you have a talk on this on the, the Gaussian processes class? Okay, I have one yes, one no, so that's fine. Uh, so in the same in the same spirit, uh, automatic hyperparameter optimization, uh, it starts to get up. I think that's an extremely promising area of research. You don't want to do a grid search uh, for hyperparameter optimization, so you want to move that away. 
Uh, so uh, right now, most of these models use Gaussian processes, uh, taking as input the value of the hyperparameters and as output the test error. Uh, typically, again, if you go to a company, I think that's the kind of project you should work on because that's a, that can save a huge amount of time. Uh, again, coming back to optimization, uh, I think it's much easier to devise a system which tries half as many hyperparameters that you uh, write an optimizer which goes twice as fast. And in both cases, you divide the computation time by two. Uh, so that's also something uh, you have to keep in mind. Uh, uh, okay, how much time do I have left? Okay, so yes, I had a picture of Mark Wahlberg and Kate Moss. Uh, okay, so, so we can stay. <laughs> uh, no, okay. I, I think I'm, I'm just going to go to uh, here. You can see the, the slides. Uh, that's a problem I've encountered in industry and again I hadn't really encountered before. So we stopped predicting clicks uh, and that, that was a picture of uh, Kate Moss and Mark Wahlberg is that when you want to drive clicks on ads, you display ads of underwear. Uh, that's a bit sad but people click on it. Uh, just to see the new model. And you, it's fairly obvious that that's not what the client wants. And so we switched to predicting sales uh, because that's actually uh, more correlated um, with with the client truly what the client truly cares about. But sales, you just don't have that many. Uh, you need about ten thousand ads to drive one sale. So suddenly, your problem uh, becomes more complicated. But you don't just have the sales, again you have the clicks. The clicks are not what you want, but you have to believe that they are somewhat crawling. And then maybe you have the sales that you help generate, so you display an ad, the user clicked on the ad, and then bought something. But maybe you displayed an ad, the user didn't click on the ad, and then bought something. And so the question is, how do you use all of that information? And so we have a lot of signal which are related to the one we really care about, and we don't have that much signal for the one for the one we really care about. And so if we treat this purely as prediction problem, we say, well, I'm going to discard all of that extra information and focus on sale prediction problem. And that's a hard problem. So I think one of the biggest challenges uh, in the years to come is really how to use all of these targets. So I'm not a big fan of unsupervised learning as to help supervise learning, because I think that there's too much to learn about the input uh, for it to be relevant. But you usually have access to a lot of mildly related tasks. And so how do you use this? So to me, really, uh, my definition of big data is that you have unstructured targets, and you need to be able to make use of all of them. So David, uh, I don't know if he's here. Um, so he had, he had a paper recently with, I think, Leo Mutu and Vladimir Vapnik on uh, multitask learning. Uh, and so I think that's really something we, we ought to learn how to do well because that occurs all the time in your life. Okay, I'm done. Thanks. Sometimes in saying uh, this is a standard way in this industry to do this or that. I'm curious to know how in this industry people are keen to share all these information in public papers or other kind of media communication. Um, okay. Uh, so I'll it's hard for me to answer this question because, by definition, if they have information, I do not have access to this information. Uh, so I'm going to say I'm going to say it this way. Uh, this has been, uh, I think, these techniques have been the main techniques used for a while. Now, some of these companies might have gone past that and with some unpublished work. Um, I think, uh, to, be, to be less affirmative, uh, 
to me, that's, that's pretty much the first thing you should do uh, before thinking of maybe other things. So you're right in that maybe companies do not share so much more advanced models that they do, and maybe what they publish on it, it's not what they use, and they're usually very careful about not saying uh, what they do use and what they don't use. Um, my, my general feeling uh, is that from experience at Creo, once you go past that, in terms of pure modeling, there just isn't that much to gain. Again, that's, that might be specific to Creo and that might be vastly different in other companies. Uh, but I think when you have these models, what you have to gain is, again, adding features or, uh, and we'll see some other things uh, tomorrow. Uh, but my personal belief is that people don't use vastly different models. Uh, again, I may be wrong about this. Uh, I know sometimes, so for instance, you can say, oh, on some of these features, they say the continuous features, rather than use, uh, rather than using gradient boosted decision trees, you can use, I don't know, deep model because you have continuous features. It might be right, and maybe many people use it. Um, for the sake of this class, I don't think it makes that much of a difference. Uh, yeah, just to get an idea of how these things work inside Critio. In terms of people, resources, time, how much is spent on like, tweaking models, playing with them, seeing what works, versus doing the plumbing of like automatically training models, reproducing them, updating them, all this stuff. And how do you think about tooling in terms of you know things like Piano where you can just script in Python and then versus like production implementations and like everything like that? Um I would say it's about, if you count all the plumbing, there's slightly more plumbing people than uh, tweaking models people. Uh, and I have a, if you take a wide definition of plumbing, that is from generating the logs to um, creating the interface uh, to interact with the models. Uh, that's, Yes, that's really a huge part, and the reason is, well, I think it should go even further that way. I think it should be, uh, the tools should be so efficient that we really don't need that, that many people to, to add features. And so we have far fewer people, I think, that add features than two years ago. Uh, and, and to me, that, that's a good thing. And I think you had a second question. Uh, yeah, just in terms of tooling, sort of, you know, Oh, yeah. Um, so the only time I tried to use Theater within Creo, it didn't handle sparse inputs. Uh, and then there's there's the uh, for, so for Theater specifically, then there's the the Python issue. Um, but yes, I think uh, I think it will be more and more common for companies to use standard toolkits and then to adapt it uh, to their needs. It, it usually depends on the, on the size of the company. So for instance, at Critio, the way it works is we tend to use an existing toolkit, and then we realize it doesn't fully satisfy our needs, and we have enough people to redesign one which is perfectly tailored to what we do. Uh, but if, because Critio is 2,600 people, um, if we were a smaller company, I would really advise against this and maybe take existing framework. Maybe just a comment. So, sorry, I had the impression that in our machine learning computations like Tiger, we have to prefer, if you want to win the competition, you have to stay <coughs> dark, right? you have to stay like an ensemble of 60 different models, uh, you know, you're going to do it and see what's going on. It seems that here it's, the story is a bit different, right? that, that you are going in the opposite direction, that if you really want to get things streamlined and, and working in production, uh, this doesn't scale well, like having all this uh, black box and you know, like 50 megas of different models. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was wondering whether I should I should talk about uh, ensemble models. That's that's a bias Critio has. Uh, I think it, it's a good one. I don't know who in the industry has it. Is that uh, we really want to be agile in terms of models, 
And so I said, uh, a few years ago, we were predicting clicks, and some point said, maybe clicks are not the way to go, we want to predict sales. And, you know, it's almost like we had to change the, the label from click to sale, and, and it was done. Um, I'm not advocating, I'm, I'm not saying this is the way to go, and maybe we should try to, to squeeze every bit of performance, including the dirty uh, assemble model. Uh, I know in our case we have frequent discussions and that's how much performance, how much performance you, you're going to get and how much agility we're going to lose. And if someone says, I can decrease the error by 5%, but I'm adding three hyperparameters, uh, then the question arises is, do you have a good way to automatically tune these hyperparameters? If you don't, is it worth the extra effort? And up until now, uh, maybe because of our particular landscape, uh, the answer was usually let's keep it simple and let's be ready to sacrifice a bit of performance to just keep improving. Uh, this might change in the future, again this might be different in other companies, uh, but yeah that's our personal bias. Well, let's